I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. The December jobs report, a blowout to the upside, beating Wall Street expectations by far. But that report came just days after stocks wrapped up the worst December performance since the depths of the Depression. What are the experts expecting in 2019? We'll ask a pair of New York Times journalists who cover that beat. Later on, I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But we begin with the political scene. Reporters have almost run out of adjectives to describe the last couple of years, what they've been like in politics, the standoff over the border wall, the government shutdown. Let's take the political pulse with Eleanor Randolph, contributing writer for The New York Times. Eleanor, welcome and thanks for joining us and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Sam. The, we heard the uh, mayor's speech this week, his State of the City speech. What did we think of that? The mayor obviously looking for a national platform as well as his New York constituency. The governor is sort of sounding a little national too. Are, do these people have any chance whatsoever of appealing, whether they're trying to or not, to a national constituency? You know, I think one of the reasons that you have so many Democrats running, I mean, the number is between 20 and 40. It's almost as many as running for public advocate. <laughs> That's right. And uh, one of the reasons you have so many is they think, uh, well, who could have ever predicted that Donald Trump would be president of the United States? So why not me? I mean, it's really interesting if you look at New York, you know, the possibilities are de Blasio. I mean, he's going around the country talking about his health plan and all this stuff he's, he plans to do for New York. He's got a dent in his um, armor because he doesn't seem to work very hard. And I think you would have to work pretty hard if you were president of the United States. And then you have Cuomo, who Cuomo swore he's not running for president. And who does work hard. And he does work probably too hard, you know. And, um, and so he gives this speech at Ellis Island, and he sounded like a guy running for president. Um, and then you have, the, you have the junior U.S. senator, Kirsten Gillibrand, and you have Cory Booker over in New Jersey. And really anybody who has, is sort of not in jail is just thinking about running. And of course primary. you have Mike Bloomberg. And of course you have Mike Bloomberg. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's looking at, at uh, the possibility of not only running as a Democrat. This is... Uh, he was a Democrat, then he became a Republican to be uh, mayor, then he decided he was an independent, and now he's decided he's a Democrat again. So, And what is the timetable? Obviously, he has a great advantage of not having to go around raising money, uh, but we're now into 2019. The election is now next year. When do these guys have to make any sort of real decision? Well, you know, Elizabeth Warren's already said she's running. And so uh, you started seeing, um, four, four years ago, you started seeing the first inklings. I mean, Trump decided he was running in 2015. Um, and or now just let people know that he was running in 2015. Um, I think probably March, April, you'll start seeing the full force of the Democratic primary field. And of these people, the New Yorkers, uh, what's your guess as to uh, which of them will I'm or like won't? Your friends in the, that are that are covering the economy. <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought. I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm not the best person. To well, you were in good company. <laughs> to answer that question, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I who knows? I I think it's going to be really interesting to see. I know the one of the Bloomberg people I talked to, or a person who supports Bloomberg, not one of his people, said that what they're hoping is that the the left wing, you know, the Kamala Harris uh, and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Madoff, Bernie, Bernie Sanders will all divide up that vote mm -hmm. and that he can come in through the center. But who knows? And does he really have a constituency that can get him elected or get him nominated, more importantly, uh, in a Democratic uh, series of primaries? Well, that is the real question. I mean, I think if he got nominated, he, he might have a chance. But 
I don't see this Democratic Party. Everything we see now is how liberal it's become, and mm. how you know you're sh it's shifting more and more to the left. But as you say, if there are enough liberal candidates, uh, there might be room for him to squeak by at the it's other all end. I'm guessing at this stage. Yes, <laughs> indeed, like the economy. Let's talk a moment about Albany. Uh, there is a Democratic. Uh, state senate, uh, which presumably will stay democratic for at least a couple of weeks. We never know what <laughs> happens in Albany. What uh, legislation that has been stalled in Albany do you think is actually likely to go through this time? Well, you know, now that you have, it's, they're all Democrats, you know, and as you know, Democrats can find reasons to fight that, uh, you know, uh, which it's the honor. circle firing squad, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But still, there are some indications that one that there are a couple of things that they're going to work on. One is they're going to they're going to codify Roe v. Wade for women in the state of New York, and that's a really important one for for most women. Uh, they're talking about changing the way the ethics commission works. Uh, that they might. <laughs> What's going to be interesting is to see how the Democrats who've always, what they've always done in the uh, assembly is they've had these fabulous bills and they look great and the goo goos love them, but they knew they didn't really have to do anything about them because the Republicans in the Senate would stop, uh, stop it. So now the question is whether they'll go back and do some of those really good uh, changes to like the voting law, mm. early voting, and and same day registration, and some of those things that would make a lot of difference in this state. Mm -hmm. What about campaign financing? You know, or public <coughs> campaign finance. Uh, <clears throat> I'm one of those people who keeps hoping they'll do something to create a floor for so that more people can run. But if you <clears throat> if you ask most Albany politicians uh, sort of when they've had a few drinks at night, they will tell you the last thing in the whole wide world they want is competition. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the rest of us want competition. They don't. And one big issue obviously coming up and the governor, for better or for worse, taking more responsibility for it is mass transit, structure of the MTA and also congestion pricing. Where do you sense we're going on that? You know, I find it so exciting that he came in and, you know, decided he was going to change the way the L was, uh, was being, uh, was going to be uh, restored. Um, <clears throat> Assuming that works. Well, but what he did when he did that was he said, this is mine. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have been arguing for. I mean, you've heard me forever. He did become a stakeholder. He became, he said it was a little bit hard to change it, but but he he made it clear that he was the one who could make a difference. He told the Daily News this past week that it should be blown up, the whole, you know, authority should be blown up. Of course, so, this is after eight years as governor. And running, basically running the MTA all that time. So, uh, no, that's the really good news. I'm so glad he's taken it aboard and said, you know, it's mine and I'm going to And hopefully he'll stick to it. Thanks to Eleanor Randolph of the New York Times. And coming up next, the economy seems to be solid. The stock market has been on a stomach-churning roller coaster ride. What's going on? Where are we heading? Some answers coming up. Job growth is strong, unemployment historically low, wages rising, and Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell has signaled a more dovish approach to rate hikes by the Fed, but the markets have been volatile to say the least. So what has investors on edge? On the list, the China trade war, President Trump's legal troubles, and erratic behavior. Higher interest rates, signs of a global economic slowdown, fears of a slowdown in the U.S., and the fading boost from the tax cuts. And that's just a partial list. So is the long bull market coming to an end, and is an ec economic slowdown or even a recession in the cards this year? 
let's ask David Enrich, finance editor for the New York Times, and his Times colleague, Peter Evis. Where are we going and which of the things on that litany of potential problems is likely to affect us? Peter, what do you think? Um, I think that, as you pointed out in your introduction, the Fed has calmed markets. So it's, that's, that's the, that's a, that was a big threat going into the end of last year. Investors were frightened that the Fed was going too quickly with interest rate hikes. They've taken that off the table, I think. But they still have this, people still have this concern about you know, global growth. There's, there was some horrible economic numbers out of Europe recently, and China is also slowing down, it seems. And once investors, you know, oh, they're just waiting to see what comes next from abroad. And some uh, companies have issued warnings about the health of uh, their businesses. Does that suggest that uh, investors might have been right about the market uh, uh, at the end of last year? Yeah, I think that, you know, especially Apple's warning. I mean, Apple's stock was tumbling well before they came out with that revenue warning. And so, yeah, I think investors kind of guessed this one right, but they may have overreacted. And you, you're seeing some, second, you know, some bullishness creeping back into the market. Stocks are, have bounced 10% from you know, their Christmas Eve low. Uh, you remember how crazy it was at the end of last year. But some calm has come back. So, David, is the Fed right or is the president right? What do you think? You know, it I have no idea, <laughs> and uh, my track record of making market predictions is very, very bad. Like everyone else. Like every, that's what I was going to say. Really, what we've seen in the past two years of the Trump presidency is just this dismal track record of people forecasting economic and financial doom, and the market for a long time, until November and December, really kept going up. I remember the night of the election, I was on basically all night duty trying to watch what was happening in the markets and they started off overseas just tanking, falling through the roof or falling through the floor and they immediately rebounded and it's been like that ever since. People keep thinking that Trump is going to screw something up so badly or the economy is just going to plunge off a cliff. That's what was happening. That was the concern in November and December of last year and I think that concern lingers in a lot of ways with Apple's uh, warning about China, the prospect of the Fed raising rates too quickly. Uh, and, you know, slowing economies in other parts of the world as well. But, you know, as we've seen this year so far, it's early, but the investors really do have this knack for kicking bad news out of their, out of their sight. Well, what is driving uh, this situation? Is the economy leading Wall Street or is Wall Street uh, leading the economy? Well, I would put it this way. I think that, I mean, we should... We should watch the economy more closely than the stock market, okay? Because you can get a bunch of economic numbers and they tell you what's happening in the economy. And they've been pretty good for, you know, the last couple of years, for a long time, in fact, even longer than that, actually, for the last, like, you know, eight years even, you know, there's been a pretty strong economy and it's been faltering in some ways. Uh, and the market, you know, like David said, goes through these freak outs where they're worried that it's all going to come to an end and it doesn't. And there aren't enough signs yet that the, the wheels have come off the economy. And so, you know, I, I would ignore the stock market um, to a large degree and just look at things like job numbers and, uh, and wage growth and things like that. And that's what the Fed was trying to do. And everybody thought because the Fed was, was reacting to a strong economy, it would keep increasing interest rates and it would go too far. And that's what freaked out the stock market. But you know what? The Fed may have been right. The Fed might be actually m more correct about the economy than the stock market, but we'll see. Well, doesn't all this, in a way, become self-fulfilling? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, that, and that's the issue. You can't really ignore the stock market because there are millions of people and countless institutions whose fortunes are in one way or another invested in or connected to the stock market. And if they're afraid the stock market might go down in the future, that leads them to pull back on the investments they're making or workers they're hiring, which, surprise, surprise, has an effect on the economy, which in turn has an effect on the stock market. So these are the, the relationship is very symbiotic between the stock market and the economy. And what, we're, what we've been seeing the past several months is that investors, not just in the US, but all over the world, are bracing for turbulence. And the expectation is that after a number of years of this eerie calm in the markets where things just kind of went up at a pretty smooth trajectory, if you smooth it out over months or years, 
that period's coming to an end, and what we're going to start seeing is much greater choppiness, much greater uncertainty, much greater volatility. Well, which kind of means that any ripple can cause a major wave one way or another. Where do you think that ripple is most likely to come? We've got lots of things going on. We've got China. We've got Brexit. Uh, we've got any possible number of economic the, indicators. The problem, though, is that anything that you or you or I comes up with right now is stuff that that's the conventional wisdom, and that's stuff that not only is kind of obvious to a lot of people, but it's also things that have already been priced into the market. Mm -hmm. Investors are already expecting that to happen. So for something to really shock people and destabilize markets, it's going to need to be something unexpected. And with the caveat of my track record is awful for making these predictions, my prediction is that a big financial institution, a big bank or hedge fund, gets brought to its knees by hackers. Mm -hmm. And that is what stuns everyone and sows fear of global financial chaos and leads to a stampede out of the markets. Boy, that ought to be pretty expected, That's specific too. enough? Yeah. yeah, okay. When? Next month. No, yeah. I'm no, I'm kidding. I don't. I have no idea. I have. There's. If I could, if anyone could predict these things, they would make tons of money in the market. And you know, you don't see that many people mastering the timing of these things. It's all a guessing game, and people more often are lucky than good. Speaking of guessing games, is there anything in a third year of a presidential cycle? Is there anything after a big jobs report uh, that suggests where the economy, where the market is going? As much as those indicators mean anything. I mean, look, I, I struggle to find something really disturbing about the United States economy right now. I mean, look, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the best times we've had in years for, for, for the regular worker. They're, they're finally getting pay increases above the rate of inflation. And nothing's, you know, inflation is not like going through the roof. You don't have to be worried about it. And if that just continues, we're in a pretty good place. I mean, people talk about all this debt in the corporate sector. They talk about, all, you know, having lived through the finance, I sound like a real old guy now, having lived through some really bad times and written about them, this doesn't that feel like That was only a decade ago. Yeah, so. yeah, I know, but one, before that as well. And yeah, you know, the old, you know, something like the scenario Dave laid out there where like a big institution gets brought to its knees by hackers is definitely really scary and would be serious. But in the actual economy, I, I don't see that much lurking right now. The, the surprise might be that we get, uh, you, know, much, mu you know, a much worse economic number than we expect out of, say, China or something like that. Those are the sort of things that could still catch the market out there, something like that. Are the stock market and the bond market sending the same signals in terms of the economy? Yeah. And it's both, it's a combination of, at times gloominess, but always recently of volatility and turbulence. And people are much more on edge, investors are much more on edge about, and much more sensitive to any hint of financial softness, not just in America, but in big foreign countries as well, whether it's China or Japan or Germany, all of which have so showed signs of slowing. And those signs translate into the companies there, the, the big debt issuers. Um, you know, it increases the risk of them having problems, which makes it more expensive for them to issue debt. And that, in turn, cycles right back through the economy. What is the prospect of China improving both economically and in terms of, of the trade war? I mean, is that likely to be resolved and in whose favor? I mean, I, I mean, look, if they actually reach some sort of agreement that just takes this trade fight off the table, uh, that 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 will that will be good for China. It'll be good for us. Uh, whether or not they actually have a sort of substantive deal that opens up China, I doubt that's going to happen. Yeah. But if it did, then that would be, I guess, bullish in the long run for for the global economy because you'd have more investment there. And uh, but I mean, a lot's got to happen for them to do that, right? Well, in the more likely scenario, and we've seen this before with Trump, is that basically nothing changes from the way it was previously, but it's mm -hmm. enough of a, enough tinkering around the edges that Trump can claim victory. So we saw that with the free trade agreements with Canada and Mexico, where it is essentially unchanged. And, but Trump gets to, is no longer called NAFTA, and Trump can say, look mm -hmm. at what I've done to protect American car manufacturers or steel producers or things like that. And I wouldn't be surprised, the Chinese are very savvy negotiators, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if they find a graceful way to let Trump claim a win, even though he's not actually getting anything. Is he right about China? Uh, what do you mean? Well, in terms of uh, tariffs and... Uh... I, th I mean, he has, he's right in the sense that 
we could be imposing higher tariffs on China. There certainly is a, a reality that other countries with lower costs of production, whether it's because of uh, paying workers less or cheaper commodity prices, do enjoy an advantage over American, some American companies. On the other hand, many American companies and almost all American consumers are huge beneficiaries of that system because we go and we buy cheap stuff, whether it's an iPhone or clothes or basically anything else. And so it's, there are trade-offs, you know? If, if, it, if we do things to protect American manufacturers of goods, that's good for American manufacturers, maybe. It's good for their workers, maybe. But we all pay the price in terms of, you know, just higher, higher price tags on things. Peter, we're coming up to a real deadline, as it seems, on Brexit. What do you think is going to happen, and how will it affect us? Okay, so the next big uh, vote is next week, I think, um, uh, whether or not Parliament is going to pass the deal, the withdrawal deal that the British government signed with the European Union, okay? So they've, they've got that, and if the parliament was to vote for that, then everyone, you know, Brexit would be kind of like the smooth thing that happens, you know, at the end of March, right? But all signs are the votes aren't there for this deal, and that opens up the possibility that, well, the, the, the one that, that scares people the most is that Britain just leaves the European Union at the end of March without a deal, mm -hmm. right? And that could lead to a sudden kind of like restrictions on trade and all sorts of other things, and that would almost certainly roil uh, the markets. But the other possibility is that it creates a sort of a, a bunch of political events that lead to maybe a new election or a bunch of votes in the Houses of, Houses of Commons that leads to a second referendum. And the British people may decide that they actually want to remain in the European Union, and the European Union might extend things for a little bit longer. The reason it affects um, the United States or anybody else outside of Britain is that, uh, you know, if it's really messy, then I expect it will like, inject some volatility into financial markets. In other words, we don't know. <laughs> it's becoming a pattern, isn't it? Yeah, it, but it's it gonna be, we're going to know. We're going to know in a couple months. Yes, indeed. Okay, Maybe. thanks to David Enrich <laughs> and Peter Evis. And coming up, some final thoughts from me on this week's edition of CODA. It's uncertain which mayor delivered the first State of the City speech. In 1887, Mayor Abram Hewitt was reminded that he was required under the city charter to, quote, communicate to the Common Council at least once a year a general statement of the city's condition. He did so even though, as he explained beforehand, he had nothing to say. This week's proved again that the annual address typically reveals more about the state of the mayor than of the city. Often it's encapsulated in a catchphrase, like when Mike Bloomberg after 9-11 said, we must be hard-nosed, we must be hard-headed, but we can't be hard-hearted. Or when Bill de Blasio first promised one New York or the fairest big city in America suggesting a sleeping beauty mirror image size matters metric in which a small city might be the fairest of them all. This year, he invoked Robin Hood. The mayoral pronouncements, like the comparable speeches by the president and the governor, are wish lists, of course. They're unspecific. They don't usually say how the goals will be accomplished or who will pay for them. The mayor says he'll guarantee universal health care, for example. But how will he persuade wary, undocumented immigrants to sign up for coverage instead of just showing up in hospital emergency rooms? Yes, global economic uncertainties loom, but the mayor said this week, New York City's economy has never been stronger. If Ed Koch called himself a liberal with sanity, de Blasio is a liberal with a bankroll. Still, city-funded spending grew less annually during de Blasio's first term than in Bloomberg's three terms, according to James Parrott at the New School's Center for New York City Affairs. And while the municipal workforce has peaked, city workers comprise a smaller share of all payroll employees than they have in 30 years. 
The problem with playing Robin Hood is that everyone hopes to be richer someday. And the legendary hero's 21st century incarnation is in the eye of the beholder. While tax cuts for the rich rob the poor of potential government services, regressive taxes imposed by government rob the struggling middle class. With all the remakes of Robin Hood the film, The Guardian recalled recently that none has come close to Errol Flynn's classic from eight decades ago. You're a strange man, Olivia de Havilland's maid Marion says to Flynn in one scene. Strange, Robin asks, because I can feel for beaten, helpless people? No, says Marion, you're strange because you want to do something about it. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.